Pan Pan Psychast. Part two: Further analysis and discussion. So in the last section, Philip, we spoke about the motivations for what you call a, a new science of consciousness or new foundations for the science of consciousness. And your solution seems to be something like panpsychism or Russellian monism. Now, we spoke to Daniel Dennett uh, quite a while ago since having you on last on the show. And he was discussing yours and uh, David Chalmers's work in this area of, of panpsychism and so on. And he had a criticism which was um, essentially that the thing you're trying to explain, i.e. consciousness, isn't explained by you radically rethinking uh, understanding of the universe. And he compared it with something he calls pan-niftyism. I'll just play you the clip of, of Dennett okay. discussing this in, in the episode. I think compare pan-psychism with a view that I'm inventing right now, which mm. I call pan-niftyism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everything is nifty. <laughs> every electron, every photon, every grain of sand, every tree, every bush, hmm. everything is nifty. What follows from that? Nothing. Mm -hmm. What follows from panpsychism? Nothing. I mean, panpsychism precisely doesn't succeed in explaining how 86 billion clueless neurons mm -hmm. can contrive to make a human mind that can mm -hmm. appreciate the Mona Lisa mm -hmm. and saying, well, each one of those neurons and each of their little parts has a little bit of psych in mm -hmm. it. That goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. Just say they're nifty. Well, nifty they are, but it, it, it's an empty, panpsychism is an empty view. So imagine you don't have much sympathy for, for Dennett's uh, <laughs> view here. Is it, is it, you, you, should you just call everything nifty and instead? Is it just as explanatory as, as your own view? Yeah. So what, I mean, I guess he's asking, is this explanatory? What, you know, what are we trying to do here? My view is um, there is something we know to be real independently of observation and experiment, namely our own feelings and experiences, right? You don't, you don't, if, if you were just going off the basis of observation experiment, you'd have no reason to believe in consciousness. You can't look inside someone's brain and see their feelings and experiences. And Dennett, to, to his credit, is wonderfully consistent on this. He thinks the only, you know, starting points for a theory of the world are third person observation experiments. Mm. If that's your methodology, um, yes, you, you know, you're not going to believe in consciousness, at least in the sense I would mean. But I think, like many people think is pretty evident, that, that, that there, we do know about the existence of con our own feelings and experiences, not through looking in people's heads, but through our immediate awareness of them. And then the task of a science of consciousness for me is how do they fit in to the world we know through through third person observation experiments so as it were you know how does what we know from the inside through our immediate awareness of our experiences fit together with what we know from the outside you know from from third person observation experiment how do those two worlds fit together so that they're actually one world the the russell eddington view does have a way of doing that. It says, you know, I mean, so just look at it this way, you know, forget whether particles are conscious. Just think, you know, what's the relationship between brain states and conscious states? You know, you, you have this feeling from that you know about from your immediate awareness of the feeling of pain, let's say. And then you've got this brain state you can see from the outside, this kind of activity in a region of the brain, let's say. Uh, how do they fit together? And here's a proposal. Well, I mean, well, you know, the dualist says, well, they're different things. We get into problems there. The, 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 the materialist says, well, really, there's just the brain state. We get into problems there. What the panpsychist says is the brain state is, the, is defined in terms of the behavior of this thing. The conscious state is its intrinsic nature. Right. So, so we, we take seriously both these things and, but we manage to have a, 
a worldview that that brings them together in a single elegant worldview. So th- I think that it depends what you're trying to do. Daniel Dennett's not trying to do that. So I mean, in a way, we're not disagreeing, man. We are disagreeing, but we're disagreeing at, at, at complete starting points. Right. He just thinks the only data are third-person observation experiments. You're the only data be theory reality. I think there's another source of data. Mm. That's our disagreement. Once you agree with me that there's another source of data, you need to have a theory about how what you know from the outside and what you know from the inside, what you know from the third person, what you know from the first person fit together. Mm-hmm. The Russell Eddington kind of view gives us the, the most elegant way of doing that. So another thing you mention in the final chapter of the book, Philip, is um, the possibility of panpsychism helping us to kind of transform our relationship with the natural world, right? So you kind of think that, well, maybe panpsychism might help us combat the climate crisis or become vegan and things like this, right? Why is it that you think now we have this panpsychist view uh, mentality is everywhere? Why does this help us with these issues? Yeah, you know, so I'm always keen to emphasize that when we're doing science or philosophy, we should be thinking about not the view we'd like to be true, but the view that's most likely to be true. So that's very important. You know, and I think there's a good case for panpsychism as the the best explanation of how consciousness fits into our overall theory of reality. But I also think it's, uh, you know, panpsychism is a view that's perhaps a little better for our mental or spiritual well-being you know materialism is a it's a pretty bleak picture of the world you've got you know a kind of mechanistic picture of nature and the cold immensity of empty space you know it's kind of pretty bleak whereas on panpsychism we are conscious creatures in a conscious universe it's a world maybe we we can feel a little bit more home in you know a little bit more comfortable in our own skin uh, and as as you say, perhaps also it can encourage a healthier relationship to the environment. If you think a tree is just a mechanism, then really it, its value is 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 indirect. It's you know it's, it has value only in terms of what it can do for us in looking pretty or sustaining our environment. But if you think a tree is a very alien kind of conscious organism, then it has a moral significance in its own right. You know, chopping down a tree is a a, an a, an action of immediate moral significance and um you know we 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 tend to laugh at tree huggers you know? but you know if a tree is a mechanism hugging it is ridiculous you know but if if a tree is a conscious organism then you know maybe it's not so maybe it comes a little bit more like stroking a cat i mean not it's not the same at all you know because it's a very different kind of creature and you can interact with a cat when you stroke it but it makes you, you have a different kind of relationship mm-hmm. with a tree or a plant if you take it to be in some sense, a conscious organism in its own right. And it's a really powerful reflection in the last chapter, and there's loads of uh, great themes in there that hopefully we'll get to touch on. And you even talk about like raising children like in this panpsychist universe, of, <laughs> uh, like tree hugging. We, we love the tree in and of itself and not just for what it can do for us. Mm. Um, in the last, last time you were on the show, in episode 25, you were speaking to David Papin, and we started speculating about this as well. And you spoke about the secret life of trees. And, and in this book, you give lots of examples of trees communicating and looking after each other and exhibiting uh, like learning and things like this, complex functions. Um, mm-hmm. There's... A tweet uh, that you posted, was it last year? Uh, enjoying Jack Simes' impression of me in the interview with Galen Strawson on the Pansycast. Although uh, I did really relate ethics of vegetarianism to the possibility that rocks are conscious, I thought the point was just that trees are probably are conscious and you've got to eat something. And I think I mischaracterized your view then in the, in the Galen Strawson interview that we did. Um, I remember saying something like, uh, so Strawson thinks, quote from Strawson, as far as I know, nothing changes. So he thinks panpsychism doesn't lead to these changes uh, in free will and and, and ethics of vegetarianism and and looking after the world or how we see the world maybe on a a moral level. I, I said your view was something like this. Everything has consciousness. And that includes not just humans and non human animals, but trees and plants as well. And that's your view. But I added this part which was which is extra and you that you perhaps don't believe in which is that when i walk down the street i kick rocks and and these are conscious properties and i can't uh, not avoid walking down the street so there's no point in me trying to to look after 
the world in a different... Does that make sense? So, right, so yeah. how was, oh, again, your view, for you, yeah. your view wrong, perhaps, is a, is a good question. Yeah, I don't think I necessarily think... Tr- so, so, yeah, panpsychists needn't think literally everything is conscious, mm. uh, you know, despite the meaning of the word panpsychism. You know, the view is the fundamental constituents of reality are conscious. conscious. It doesn't mean every random combination, especially if you're a strong emergentist, mm. you're likely to think it's only very specific combinations of things that bring about consciousness at the macro level. Maybe when they, when they have, when you have more integrated information in the whole and the parts. Um, so yeah, so that wasn't the point. I, I think that the thing for me is just, if like most people, you know, you think plants aren't conscious, they're not sentient, then there's a clear moral dividing line. You know, we can say, let's not eat things that are conscious. You know, <laughs> and that's a nice, we can keep plants. That's a nice, but I do think I, plant, plants are conscious. And so there isn't that clear dividing line, mm-hmm. you know, to divide between the things it's okay to eat and the things it's not. I've actually, yes, yeah, so I've been going back and forth about what is my ethical food policy. Just in the last couple of weeks, I've uh, decided on a policy. <laughs> so I decided to not eat red meat mm-hmm. or dairy unless the calves are kept with the cows. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm kind of concerned about animal suffering and, you know, I think it is, partic- it is pretty cruel when the uh, the calves are taken away from the cows, you know, there's a pretty sophisticated emotional bond there. So, so it's more animal suffering that, and of course the environment mm. that matters more than necessarily killing an animal. Is it just the kind of push one? Is it just the, it's just cows? Is if you, you practicing like vegetarianism in relation to, to other um, conscious animals? Well, red like, so, a, like chick, do you eat chicken and fish? I, and I eat like chicken this? and fish, yeah. So I guess I don't see... It's hard for me to divide, give a clear dividing line between a chicken and a fish or, or, a, or a plant because I think these are all conscious things. So I think, you know, my approach is to, you know, try to allow all these conscious organisms to have as, as flourishing a life as right. possible. And I think it's particularly cruel when you separate a cow from its offspring you know especially dairy, you know it's sort of repeated 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 mm. and you know cows do mourn you know for four days or so when their children are taken from them so so you know i'd rather avoid cheese than you know than than, than eating chicken or something right, because okay. of that but um but there are ethical dairies as i was talking about that people pointed out to me on twitter when was, uh that they do keep the calves with the cow. So basically it will mean occasionally, I mean, I absolutely love cheese. It will occasionally having cheese and milk chocolate, you know, birthday and Christmas, you know, from an ethical dairy. Right. So. so. So one of the things you mention of potential criticism here is that, you know, you say that now that the universe is, is, we're at one with it again, we're like the universe again, it has consciousness like us and we'll value trees and things that we now recognize as, as conscious when before we didn't think they were conscious as, as valuable and worth moral consideration. But it, as I was flicking through this chapter and, and deliberating it a bit more, I was thinking at the present moment, most people recognize that non-human animals are conscious and they have the capacity mm. to suffer and it doesn't matter to them now yeah so and in your example of like chickens and fish being a, a, a one so do you do you think pragmatically recognizing the truth of panpsychism will lead to us actually making good moral decisions on this on this new science well but, but i was just thinking with reference to plants and trees most people don't think they're conscious and so it's you know we we all see the you know the terrible cutting down of trees and you know mass burning of forests that's going on at the moment you know we feel bad about that but i think we'd feel much worse about it if we thought these these trees were conscious creatures in some sense so that would make a difference also i think you know i just think i think we are living in time where as max weber has this phrase the disenchantment of nature you know we feel like we're living in a meaningless universe and and maybe people turn to nationalism and consumerism to sort of try and find some meaning in their lives whereas you know if we're conscious creatures in a conscious universe i think we sort of fit in a little bit more to reality and we can maybe feel a little bit more comfortable Mm. in the absence of man-made 
senses structures of meaning how's that different to like a physicalist's account then so if i'm a physicalist Mm. i just think there's just physical stuff out there in the world i feel at one with the universe now because i am identical with it how's yeah is it more against the dualist that position yeah that's a good point i suppose i think actually we we can't really live as physicalists and you know david papano who is a physicalist kind of agrees with that i think right. you know there's something buy. what we can't help but buy into yeah, dualism. So, like so when we pretend we're physicalists people we might intellectually believe physicalism mm. but we can't help thinking creatures with consciousness are somehow different from the rest of the universe mm. and um you know there's just some whether it's true or not there's some psychological difficulty i think we we inevitably end up thinking in dualist terms. I mean, I remember a long time ago reading uh, a philosopher called Val Plumwood. She's this eco-feminist mm. philosopher. And she thinks that this sort of panpsychism, this kind of like consciousness type of panpsychism, isn't going to do the job that we want it to do right. of like re-enchanting the universe because it's still making the same mistake that the dualist make. So the dualist says, oh, the only thing is valuable is something like me, right? Yeah this special consciousness stuff mm. so then the panpsychist who goes oh well there's this special consciousness stuff everywhere makes the mistake of going the thing that is valuable is the thing that i have and to make the world valuable i make mm. it in my image mm-hmm. so she says well look if you're gonna if you if you really want to change the world and do the stuff you can't you can't have this sort of panpsychism you have to have a different sort of um view that recognizes the dissimilarity of nature but at the same time the continuity so she thinks if to do that instead we shouldn't say that everything's phenomenal but we should say that a philosopher's term intentional everything has a aim or a telos or it mm-hmm. directed at things um have you any thoughts about this sort of intentional like panpsychism yeah that's really interesting um and w- one thing i was just gonna say that Part of the re- evidence that people think in dualist terms, you know, often when people say they, they're materialists, they st- they say they think of it as the view that the brain gives rise to consciousness, produces consciousness. It affects are distinct from their causes. I am I was caused to be by my parents. I'm distinct from my parents. So if the brain causes consciousness. That means consciousness is sort of distinct from the brain. So I think you know it's David Chalmers' view that the brain causes consciousness. That's the dualist view. So I think you know people who end up thinking in dualist sense. Sorry, but coming back to your point, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, yeah. So, uh, well, I wonder whether that argument sort of seems to be self-defeating in itself. It's sort of saying we shouldn't model everything in our image as um, conscious that ever that we're conscious of everything else is conscious. But how does that differ if we say, well, well, we have intentionality, you know, we have um directedness, therefore everything has directedness. Isn't that the I mean, I think, you know, the problem is if you follow the Russell Eddington line, mm-hmm. we don't really know what the intrinsic nature of the stuff out there is. You know, the the only access we have is it, it, what we know about physical reality from our from our own awareness of our own minds. I mean, all we can do is, I think, you know, the most simple parsimonious proposal. All I know, you know, so all I know about reality is some of it, i.e. the stuff in brains has a consciousness involving nature. The simplest uh, speculation from that starting point, and this is kind of Eddington's line, is that the stuff outside of brains is continuous with the stuff inside of brains and also having a consciousness involving nature so whether that but whether we can make the same about directedness i don't think animals are directed at goals in the way we are quite i don't think they consciously self-consciously aim at least not a very abstract goals in the way we do right. uh, whereas they are ex- they do have experience in the same way we do, in the same broad sense that there's a first-person perspective. Uh, so, so I guess I think maybe the, the, the directedness stuff is is more anthropomorphic, perhaps. Right. You know, that's a more distinctively human trait. But I'll have to think about it some more. It's an interesting line of argument. Just for clarification, like the, the plant, for example, does it matter on whether or not it can suffer? So like if it has like a nervous system or something, it can experience pain? Or is it just that taking out of existence consciousness or like a a complex form of consciousness in the case of the plant 
that's the bad thing. So, so I'm kind of getting at what's the moral value in something being conscious? Because when I kick the rock, it hasn't got integrated information about itself. It's not got con- it hasn't got a conscious, complex mind. But the plant, does it matter mm. if it can, if it knows it's not fulfilling its goal, or if it knows it's suffering? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure I've given too much thought to distinguishing those two things in this context. I know I was talking to Luke Roloffs recently, who does think plants are conscious, but actually doesn't think they suffer. Right. He thinks that they, you know, that is kind of anthropomorphic projecting our kind of consciousness. I guess I'm kind of inclined to think plants do suffer. Okay. Um, I can't see what, you know, it seems in the whole animal kingdom that the frustration of aims is accompanied by suffering. I don't see why that wouldn't carry over to the plant case. I don't see the relevant difference. And And certainly the thing that's, more morally important is the suffering you know i think read about when I, i've got this huge madagascan dragon tree called susan in my office and i worry when i'm away and not watering uh and you know uh, yeah I, I, i'm inclined to think there's a there's a kind of suffering there mm. but you're right i suppose there is some disvalue in removing a conscious being from the universe mm. things get more abstract here don't they if, if there's an if there's an imperative to maximize the number of conscious beings, you might think there's a moral imperative to reproduce yeah. and, you know, so things get more more messy there and familiar worries about utilitarianism that I don't know what to think about. But certainly, yes, suffering. That's And that's the thing I'm most concerned about is, you know, the suffering of conscious organisms, which I take plants and trees to be. Well, it's interesting. You give this, like, there's two reasons you give in the book for why dualism uh, isn't, it doesn't have a, like a, a positive upshot. If dualism is true, it leads to a sense of separation from the world. We're not like the world. That's mechanistic. And I'm not, I'm conscious. And panpsychism alleviates us of that boundary. And the second one being that we treat the world um, not having value in and of itself, but being extrinsically valuable to us. And something Greg and I were uh, debating over a pint yesterday evening was, I said, but but why does that matter? Why does it matter if I don't value it in and of itself? I value it for its benefit to me. Mm. If we think about uh, trees and rainforests, um, mm. if I was, if I value it for the sake of me, I'm inclined to preserve that thing, look after that thing, and keep sustaining the growth of that those trees, so it can keep benefiting me in the long term. We're just not very good at it as human beings. <laughs> uh, we're just time bias and and uh, hedonistic, maybe. So if we see value in nature for our benefit, we're just as likely to uh, look after that thing as if we saw it as intrinsically valuable in and of itself is the, is the line of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, Well, I suppose, as you say, we haven't proved very good at it. I suppose the familiar way of presenting environmental concerns in terms of, you know, self selfish, you know, about how the effect on humans, perhaps animals as well. Mm. I, I suppose it, it ends up looking in the fairly far future and it's hard for us to take seriously the concerns of future generations as opposed to me having a holiday this year or um, whereas I hope if we're empathetic, I mean, at least it adds another concern <laughs> if there's if if there's both pragmatic self selfish reasons to care about trees and their focus of immediate morals that, that, that would presumably give an extra push one would hope and of course if if they really are suffering as i i believe they are then then that's important and we should know about it and i think we've got good reason to think they are but yeah i mean look it's something's not going right is it we're you know we're all about to kill ourselves uh so and you know this is all speculative it's not like i've done a kind of serious empirical survey to see people's reactions and what happens if you raise kids as pan It's all just very speculative. The the final chapter is more in that mode of thinking, you know, trying things out. But, but you know, something's not going right the way things are now. And it'll add something to the scale of things that we should be concerned about if we, if we do value it in and of itself as well as yeah, to us. I maybe. think so. It seems plausible at least. Let us stop for a wee jiffy to hear a quick message from our wonderful sponsors, Gaston Luger. 
Gaston Luga strive for perfection in everything they do, whilst also taking care of our environment. I think it was Kierkegaard who said we need to learn to live as a single individual. Well, Gaston Luga disagree and argue that scientifically, nothing attracts a partner more than a beaten Gaston Luger backpack. Their new bitten backpack has adjustable padded straps that allow for an undeniably comfortable fit that even Descartes couldn't doubt. A sleek slip-over strap provides quick attachment to your luggage, and like the Buddha, freedom from your emotional luggage, with an inner padded laptop compartment to hide all of your Marxist fan fiction, and two dual quick access pockets on the outside to keep your ethics separate from your metaphysical beliefs. Bitten truly combines style, form and function. To celebrate the festive season, Gaston's Black Friday offer gives you 25% off all of their backpacks. Me, Greg, Ollie and Andy are always recommending them as the most stylish ethical backpack and if you're interested in getting one, head over to www.gastonluger.com. Gaston Luger's Black Friday campaign is running up until early December 2019. Once again, that's 25% off and a free Arlick travel bag. Miss the deal? You can still use the discount code PANSY15, that's P-A-N-P-S-Y-1-5, to get 15% off. That's www.gastonluga.com. A link is also in the iTunes description. Thank you again to Gaston Luga for supporting the show. Let's head back over to the discussion. So not only do you think panpsychism has the opportunity maybe to help us with problems of like meaning and value in the world, you also think, well, is this other huge debate uh, in philosophy that is the, you know, the existence of free will, right? And you also, in the, in, at the end of the book, talk about, well, can panpsychism offer some sort of interesting or new take on the problem of um, the existence of free will? And you say, I believe it's still an open question whether or not free will is an illusion. But it's worth noting that panpsychism, unlike materialism, is in principle able to preserve its reality. Past events pressure physical entities, but it's always up to present physical entities whether or not to accept the pressure. So why do you think this? Why do you think panpsychism um, can help us with the problem of the freedom of the will? Yeah, so I'm kind of a free will agnostic. You know, I think it's ultimately an empirical question. But I'm inclined to think, you know, we don't really know enough about the brain to be able to know one way or another, whether we're free in the strong libertarian sense. Mm -hmm. um, so some people think, some people like Sam Harris think, you know, these libert experiments and m more recent ex similar experiments have conclusively proved that no one has free will. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of, as I talk about in the book, I'm sort of skeptical about what these, so what are the, what these experiments show. Um, but it's, so it seems to me what is most problematic about the the strong free will position, the libertarian free will position, is that it's sort of dualistic nature. It tends to assume that free will is this magical thing that just pops up in human beings you know, and the, you know, the rest of nature lacks it and uh, the, the causation in the rest of nature is completely different. And, that, you know, that's really weird and magical. And, you know, th that's what I'm motivated against, these kind of disunified, ugly pictures of nature. I think that's a strong motivation for doing science and philosophy to try and have a unified, elegant picture of nature. So I do try to explore this panpsychist view so again, you know, I'm an agnostic about free will, but if you're going to believe in strong free will, it would be nice to have a picture of the world that's more unified, where freedom is something that exists throughout nature and not just in human beings or higher animals. So this is the the, the pan-libertarian view I, in, in an experimental way, sort of try out. Um, I mean, one way of explaining it that, so it's not how I put it in the book, but I mean, let's just pretend particles are billiard balls, right, for, for the sake of simplicity. So, you know, we tend to think that one billiard ball compels another. So, the, you know, the white ball hits the red ball and compels the red ball to shoot off the table. Here's another possibility. Maybe the white ball creates an inclination in the red ball to shoot off the table, across the table. But it's, but then that the red ball freely chooses whether or not to follow that inclination right now you might think 
Well, that's crazy. If you know the the bulls are just deciding what they want to do, then it also <laughs> can be kind of chaotic. Whereas it's quite predictable. But my thought was, well, because billiard balls are so stupid, <laughs> because they don't have kind of rational reflection, they're inevitably just going to follow their inclinations. So, I mean, I was, I guess, I was, I was raising an infant when I was writing this book, and I was thinking, you know, if you've got a young infant, if they want to do something they're going to try and do it. You know, they, they don't sort of think, should I do this? Is this the right thing to do? They're just going to do it. So so the thought was, well, I'm ultimately thinking about particles. I don't think really think billiard balls are conscious or free or whatever. So the thought would be that particles at earlier times set up inclinations, particles at later times, but the, the, the particles at later times are inevitably going to follow their inclinations because they're so stupid, because, they, you know, because they can't rationally reflect they're just going to follow their inclinations, and that's why we get a predictable world. So, look, I'm not. This is not a. This is not a view I believe, but it seems to me consistent with observation, coherent. It seems to me, if you believe in strong libertarian free will, this is quite an attractive picture of nature for it to fit into. Mm. I'm actually um, working this out as an academic paper, actually, um, for the um, Aristotelian Society at the moment. To sort of, I just thought, well. It was it was a sort of experimental thing in the book, but then I thought, well, let's let's see if it, if if we can make more rigorous sense of this. So yeah, you mentioned uh, Sam Harris there in your answer, and you note in the book that people like Sam Harris and one of our previous guests, Steve Pinker, think there's something called objective morality. Like there's a fact about the matter that like the Holocaust is a bad thing. It's not just uh, unfashionable or subjectively bad. Like there's a fact about the world that makes it bad. And you say in the book that these these attempts from people like Sam Harris and Pinker just don't fully encapsulate what it is to be an objective moral fact. And neither do the theists who often point to the existence of God, like William Lane Craig, posits the existence of God perhaps to say that God gives us a moral standard. And you quote the famous Euthyphro dilemma, which is our next installment of the podcast coming out next week, uh, where we're looking at uh, the Socratic dialogue from Euthyphro. He's saying oh, it's not clear whether God um, says that things are good and therefore it makes them good, or he just points to good things out there in the world and says, that's a good thing independently of me. You think that panpsychism has the potential maybe to bring uh, to give a solution to to objective moral facts don't you which the theists and the atheists currently are unable to do again emphasizing this is the more experimental part of the book just trying out ideas mm. and again it's not necessarily something i believe or even think is probable um so in in many religious traditions throughout history throughout in many different cultures Certain people have claimed that through intense meditation, uh, various spiritual practices, you can come to see that um, underlying each person's individual consciousness is some kind of universal, unconditioned consciousness. Uh, and it's the same in each of us. So, you know, unconditioned, universal consciousness is underlying my mind and it's underlying Greg's mind and it's underlying... Jack's mind, and you know, in ordinary life, we we can't kind of see this. We're confused, but then when we if we meditated enough, if we meditate enough, we you know we come to see this truth. Um, I don't know if that's true. I, I haven't med I meditate every morning actually, but I haven't yet had mystical enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But um, but it strikes me that you know, so most pe people are skeptical about this because they assume it would commit to something supernatural that this sort of universal consciousness that underlies all things would be kind of outside of the material universe mm. but my thought was if you're a panpsychist you don't have to say that you could say this is just part of the intrinsic nature of matter that uh, you know that there is um this universal uh component of the intrinsic nature of matter that's present in all things as well as uh more specific uh properties of matter you know that could be just a claim about the intrinsic nature of the physical world and i sort of spell out a view based on a certain kind of um super substantivalist view that um space time is the fundamental reality um now if you did have that view then i think it does give you a nice grounding for for why i should be nice to other people because it t it would turn out that there's something kind of irrational about the selfish individualist way of doing things because you're 
my, I'm assuming that my conscious mind is entirely distinct from Greg's conscious mind is entirely distinct from Jack's conscious mind. Uh, and on the mystical view, that's just false. Actually, what one fundamental component of my mind is numerically identical is one and the same thing as this same component in your mind and, and everybody else's mind. So, so the, uh, the, the, the selfish individualist view just is based on a false view of reality. So, um, so again, I don't know if this is true. I haven't meditated enough, but if you're a panpsychist, it, it, it remove it, it stops this view being metaphysically problematic mm-hmm. in a way it would be in, say, a materialist worldview. So, speaking of things that are metaphysically problematic, uh, and you mentioned that the intrinsic natures as well. So we st- we looked at this argument at the beginning, which is you know the um, as you say, well. F- Physics just tells us what matter does, right? But you might get people who um, say, well, look, yes, Galileo changed the rules, right? Let's say he started writing things in the laws of math, the, the, the book of the universe in the language of maths, and the language of maths in physics just tells us what stuff does. But they go, that's all there is to the show. There isn't this background mm. intrinsic nature, at what Arthur Eddington says, the stuff behind the... Uh, the pointers on our dials and on, on our measuring devices. That is all there is. There's just the doing. There's no being. I mean, how do you respond to uh, this sort of objection? Because we had Stephen Mumford here yesterday, oh, for our listeners in the future, and he thinks this, right? He thinks that's all there yeah. is or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, so many of my colleagues here at Durham would say, okay, science just tells you what stuff does. That's all there is. We should think, you know, so once you know everything there is to know about what an electron does, you know everything there is to know about what an electron is. So yeah, as you sometimes call causal structuralism or dispositional essentialism. So I think there's there's two things one can say in response to this. Firstly, there is a line of argument going right back to um to to Russell, and I've given a form of this myself which tries to show that trying to do it without intrinsic natures ultimately leads to an unintelligible picture of the world. And that's because, you know, if the nature of a thing is just defined in terms of it, of what it does, you're effectively defining its nature in terms of its impact on something else. And then that something else, its nature is defined in terms of its impact on something else. And its nature is defined in terms of its impact on something else. And this kind of goes on for, forever or, or goes around in a circle. And so we end up with a kind of vicious circularity that sort of everything's defined in terms of everything else. So, so I mean, to think of a concrete example, if if I ask what you know, what's mass, and you say, well, mass is you know gives rise to gravitational attraction. And you say, okay, well, what's gravitational attraction? And you say, well, it's what it's you know involves the distance between objects reducing. And you say, okay, well, I don't understand that until I know what distance is. What's distance? And you then give some other equations of physics that characterizes distance in terms of other physical properties, including mass. And so, you know, you, you quickly go around in a circle and without any way of giving any independent characterization of these properties, we don't really end up with any grip on the world. So, I mean, so a very simple analogy I give in the book is to say, you know, suppose I have three matchboxes and I say there's a... Uh, there's a blurp, a twerp, and a merp. I can't remember the words I used. He said, well, what's a blurp? So the, in the first one, there's a blurp. The second one, there's a twerp. And the third one, is a merp. So I said, what's a blurp? And you say, oh, blurp, it's a thing that makes twerps. And you go, well, okay, I don't know what that means until I know what a twerp is. What's a twerp? And you go, oh, you know, it's a thing that makes merps. And you say, well, okay, I don't know what that means until I know what a merp is. And you say, oh, merp's a thing that makes blurps. Was that the first thing? <laughs> I've forgotten. You know, and you just go around in a circle and you don't know what the hell any of this means. You don't know what's in the matchboxes. So I think if we were just going off physics to uh, get a grip on the nature of reality, we just go around in a circle and we don't really get any grip on the world. It's only by having some independent understanding of the nature of stuff, for example, through your immediate awareness of experience, that you can fill in the abstract structure you get from physics. That was quite long-winded, but just, 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 just to say, even if you don't buy that argument, even if you think we don't, we can in principle do without intrinsic natures, I still think 
We've got good motivation to postulate intrinsic natures. Why? Because it leads to this very attractive way of fitting consciousness into the physical world. But what would you say to someone who said, well, look, no, you're being the twerp, right? Because... Although it's circular, thank you. Although it's although it appears sh- to be circular. Shot in the foot there. Yeah. <laughs> although it appears to be circular, it's not vicious. It's just like a big and you mentioned mm. this in the book. It's just like a big spider's web or a big holistic hole of all these things connecting and explaining each other. But that doesn't mean that the whole lacks this thing. Um mm. so I think I mean, this is, I think this this is a lot of people say this in the literature. He goes, Yeah, we're gonna pass the book each step but as long as there is a whole sustaining the whole thing it doesn't matter with everything's inter interdefined in a non-vicious way yeah so russell famously said this is a view in which everybody is doing everybody else's washing and then someone else said well as long as all the washing gets done uh yeah, yeah so and you know yeah as john hawthorne has pointed out and someone says you know there are logical ways of characterizing everything at once you can give a big ramsey sentence i'm not going to go into what a ramsey sentence is but the you know there are logical tricks for you know defining everything at once i suppose i i think there's two views here there's causal structuralism that everything is defined in terms of what it does and then there's an even more extreme view pure structuralism that you you drop the causal notions you just Capture the nature of reality in pure maths, pure mathematics. Uh, this is maybe James Ladyman's view. Uh, so that's a more radical view. So I was just, I think the regress argument just applies to the, the causal structuralism. So yeah, so maybe, yeah, even if in principle you can um, identify each property in terms of some, you know, causal web, still the causal structuralist position is, the nature of something is given by what it does. Mm-hmm. So I want to know, what does it do? What does mass do? Forget giving me this big network that, you know, identifies mass in terms of its place in the network. I want to know, what does mass do? And I think, you know, as a core structure, you have to answer that question. But as soon as you do, you, you get into this trouble. Uh, so so I, I, I do think the pure structuralist avoids this, but then they get into other worries. So yeah, so it's important to distinguish these these two these two kinds of view in the final closing pages of the book you talk about how on a scientific worldview we might think the universe is entirely devoid of meaning we're tiny uh, creatures we're a painful accident of nature and you you kind of give this uh, i guess it's like a triumphant or um, not motivational I, i'm trying to find the word like enriching like little speech essentially of saying that if we adopt panpsychism or if we get on board with this new science of consciousness, then suddenly uh, the world comes alive again for us. The universe is like us and it, it's enriched with this, this special property. Um, but it, it, it's a, maybe a technical question, maybe it's just the labeling of, of the little section at the end of the book. He's saying it gives a universe of meaning, but it seems like it's just a universe which is just enriched with consciousness. So I guess yeah. a, a question of like existential meaning. Do you think that Adoption, your view, gives our life uh, any more purpose than it has now. Does that make sense? It does. That's a very good question. Yeah, you've honed in on the second cringiest part of the book. (laughs) (laughs) This over-the-top dramatic (laughs) ending. uh, um, Yeah, you're right. So I don't want to overplay it. Panpsychism, as I say, is, you know, slightly better for our mental and spiritual health. It's a view of the world we fit into. Mm. We can feel a bit more at home in. But you're right. It still doesn't necessarily, it's still not necessarily a universe with a purpose, a universe that's going somewhere. It's still a universe that, if you know, the best guess of physics tells us it's going to all come to nothing and all the energy is going to be used up and it'll all come to nothing. And that makes, that work, that bothers me. And I don't think a panpsychist worldview helps with that, really. Uh, I suppose if you do go further to the, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you have a way of making sense of free will, you know, that can accommodate more of how we naturally understand ourselves as human beings. If you take the, if you adopt the mystical thing I was talking about, then then that also leads to a richer, perhaps more satisfying picture of the world. Again, they're not essential components of panpsychism at all. Uh, you know, that that's an extra, an, an extra step one would have to make. 
But but you're right. I mean, none of those things really give a sense of purpose or meaning or a direction to the universe. That 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 would be a further step, and I don't think just going for panpsychism helps. I mean, I, I should add again that panpsychism does have these associations with mystical views, but most of the people defending it these days are complete atheists. You know, David Chalmers, Luke Roloffs, that are just think there's this real natural phenomenon consciousness we know it exists we have to fit it in somehow mm-hmm. this is a good way of doing it so so it is important to that to, to know that panpsychism isn't necessarily wrapped up with these spiritual pictures of the world but if you for independent reasons you you do have certain spiritual beliefs perhaps the panpsychist world is more consonant with them although not necessarily you know a world with purpose that that you might get in a more sort of theistic worldview or something. So a lot of people have historically thought panpsychism seems a bit crazy or a bit weird or um, it's an implausible metaphysical conclusion or something like this, right? Um, But, and that's how it might appear to the layperson, but are you confident that, you know, attitudes are changing and people will soon start to come round to this idea that, you know, this is a proper view, this needs to be taken seriously, and it does offer genuine solutions to uh, uh, genuine problems. Yeah, I think so. Um, You know, it has these cultural associations, but at the end of the day, you know, I think you should judge a view not by its cultural associations, but by its explanatory power. And I think it does have a way of bringing consciousness into our worldview in a way that avoids the deep difficulties facing other views. I think what will change ultimately is in our current scientific worldview, we don't take consciousness as a datum in its own right. You know, most, it's not that, you know, most people wouldn't want to deny the existence of consciousness, but they don't draw the implication from that, that consciousness is a datum in its own right. Most people think the job of science is to account for observation experiment. If you've got a theory of reality, that can account for all the data of observation experiments. That's it. Job done. No, there's this other thing we know to be real that we have to account for as well, the reality of consciousness. So the, the most important thing to me is, is not even panpsychism, is just that consciousness is a datum in its own right over and above the data of observation experiment. That's the crucial point we need to get to, I think, as a scientific and philosophical community. And I think we will do because the reality of consciousness is is so evident. And the the fact that it has a quality involving nature that can't be captured in purely quantitative terms is also pretty evident that I think we will get to that point. And that, and that will be, you know, a radical change in our worldview and does open you up very much to possible views like panpsychism. So, you know, when you're in the mindset of thinking science is just about observation experiment, of course, panpsychism is crazy because, you know, physics doesn't seem to be telling those particles are conscious. So I think that's how people are thinking. That's why I think it's crazy. But as soon as you appreciate, no, there's this other datum, you know, you start to see the, the, the inherent plausibility of panpsychism. I mean, I've kind of lost any sense that it's crazy at all now. And uh, you know, and I do think things are changing. It's gone from being a position that was laughed at insofar as it was thought of at all to being a position that's taken very seriously as um, a respected minority view. Although an, although another problem is things are so specialized these days. So, you know, the view is now taken very seriously in philosophy of mind, but people working in metaphysics the mem- mightn't have got the memo, you know, they, it hasn't got around yet. And so they still think, oh, everyone's materialists. Uh, you know, whereas in the olden days, you know, great philosophers like uh, David Lewis and David Armstrong, they did the philosophy of mind and the metaphysics. But these days, people just tend to be so kind of siloed. So, I mean, that, that's another motivation for writing this book aimed at a very general audience to try and, you know, I think philosophers need to do this a lot more to try and connect with scientists, to try and connect with a general audience. Yeah. So yeah, I, I am confident that this is, that, that, um, it's not, the most important thing isn't the truth of panpsychism. I'm confident that consciousness is a, is a datum in its own right and that we will, as a society, come to see that and that this will bring about profound changes in how we look at the physical universe and how we understand what it is to be a human being. A round of concluding remarks then. Uh, Dr. Miller, do you want to kick us off? 
Uh, I really enjoyed reading the book, Philip. I thought it was, um, like you say, the, um, if if your aim is to get the message out there that we should take consciousness seriously, then it certainly does that, and it does it really well. Um, um, Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I, I really yes. enjoyed the kind of this last chapter as well, where it's kind of like, well, look, let's kind of take the take panpsychism and then let's apply it to these other uh, problem, historically significant problems in philosophy uh, and our worldviews, and see how it lends its hand there if it has one to lend. And I thought that was really good and really exciting. Yeah, I, um, thank you as well. I think the uh, text itself, I really enjoyed uh, reading it through having the name of the show being the panpsychas often people think it's a show just about panpsychism there's very little panpsychism that actually goes on on the show so if anyone's listening to this and thinking finally an actual (laughs) in-depth conversation about panpsychism i can't recommend picking up the book enough it is whether you're a a general um outside of uh, formal education in philosophy if, if you just um, interested in the the questions of philosophy of mind and panpsychism, it's a great introductory text for anybody, and I think it would serve really. Well. I think someone mentions this in um, in in the book in one of the reviews, saying it's a great introductory text. Or a, a, oh, you mentioned it earlier. You can use it in a course at university. So I think it's got right. great um, flexibility in the ways that, that it can be used. And often the philosophy of mind conversation follows a very similar structure. It, we go from a hard problem to uh, we, we kind of did this a little bit, but that, that may um, we're stuck in our ways. A hard problem in there, dualism and physicalism. And we've played it out with kind of the same problems with the views. But there's like a new and interesting spins on uh, problems in the book, which even if you're already familiar with the current debates, there's something new and extra there for you. We're often talking about the ethics of panpsychism and we don't really get to, to talk about it in much depth. So again, I really enjoyed that last chapter uh, of the book as well. And and yeah, I I go away and think about that some more. I think about ethical implications and whether or not it enriches the universe. Um, so yeah, it's been a pleasure. So thank you again for joining us for that. Oh, thank you very much. Pop 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 pop. pop, pop. Philosophy quiz. You haven't got away with it just yet. We have one more edition, which is Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. So we're playing a game called Goff's Error, and we're playing Philippa Goff, Philip Goff. So you're going to have quotes from a Philippa, a Goff, and a Philip Goff. So your quotes from Philippa Foote, the English philosopher, best known as one of the founders of contemporary virtue ethics and close friend of Iris Murdoch, Elizabeth Anscombe, and Mary Midgley. You've got a Goff, which is Noel Fielding, the English comedian, writer, and actor. And you've got Philip Goff the uh, philosopher and consciousness researcher at Durham University. Uh, Greg, you can play along as well. You haven't seen these, have you? So you either say, not. fastest thing, you either this say... Is, this is what I've been looking forward to. This is the reason I agreed to do it. <laughs> it's my favourite part of the podcast. It's everybody's favourite. I'm glad you said that. No one's ever actually... If you'd have just said to come for just this, <laughs> I would have been up for it. So anyway, sorry. You just say Philippa Goff or Philip Goff. Excellent. When I was 13, I told my dad I'd rather kill myself than do an ordinary job. That's okay. Noel Fielding. That's Noel Fielding. Oh, I was going to say that. Oh, that's, I that's forgot one you had to say I one was going to say that. You ask a philosopher a question, and after he or she has talked for a bit, you don't understand your question anymore. Philippa. That's Philippa. That's one. Yeah. Having recently reproduced, I found myself singing a lot of children's songs. Philip Goff. That's <laughs> Philip that me? Two, one. It's impossible to be unhappy while wearing a poncho. Uh, the fielding. No, fielding fielding it's too I got, that, I? I got i need the first one i did, forgot the rules how can we explain the ongoing mass appeal of star wars F- F- fielding that's no? not fielding that that's me? philip goff that's philip goff anyone what? who thinks about it can uh, see I that for human beings from. the teaching and following of morality is something necessary Philippa. That's Philippa. That's three all. I had always drawn every day as long as I held a pencil and just assumed everyone else had two. Art has saved me. Fielding. me. That's Fielding. It's four three. People said, you must be mad or on drugs, which I found a bit disappointing. What about imagination? Fielding. It's Fielding. We're on five three now to to Philip. You're you're leaving you for dust here. Uh, How could an equation ever explain to someone what it's like? Oh, (laughs) to taste paprika and let's play out winner takes it all when the israelites were fleeing egypt god drew back the me waters philip the... goff it's philip goff yes <laughs> god i was getting too i'm getting too much my heart's beating i'm getting too much into this i've got a competitive spirit 
Don't forget, this episode was brought to you by our wonderful supporters, uh, Cullum St. Gabriel's and Westland Endowment, as well as our phenomenal patrons. A massive thank you to the paprika enthusiastic Dylan Kirby, the blue banana identifying Lily Hooper, the tree hugging David Ligeness, the omniscient demon that is Mr. T, and the man who knows what it's like to be a bat, Jimmy Casperson and the criminal responsible for locking up young girls in a black and white room for his own metaphysical gain, Mr. Jim Clare. If your universe is enchanted by the show, please, please consider supporting us at patreon.com forward slash pansycast. Our pre-show pre-releases to all of our Socrates episodes coming up are already available on the Patreon. Links to all the Philip Goff's work can be found on our website, including a link to his excellent new book, Galileo's Error. A link's in the iTunes description as well. We'll also be giving away some signed copies of the book on social media, so head over there to be in with a chance of winning. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Dr. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. Philip Goff. Thank you very much. I'm glad I won the competition. Thank you. <laughs> and me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. That's really good. <laughs> oh, should I, I should have said something nice, shouldn't I? Uh, no, 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 no. It's been a really nice conversation.